Uh, I'm Bruce Momgen. I've been working with Postgres for 20 years. Uh, I live in Philadelphia, which is in the United States. And um, I'm here to talk to you about some of the history about Postgres and what I see are some of the exciting some of the exciting things that I think are going to be happening in the years to come with Postgres. This is one of my presentations. I have about 30 Postgres presentations on my website. If you go to this uh, URL right here, um, that's where the presentations are. There are many videos of me presenting as well. I attend about 30, presenta uh, 30 events a year. So this is uh, one of 30 basically um, that I'll be doing. I work for a company um, headquartered in the United States called Enterprise DB. They have a global uh, set of customers and uh, they've been sort of helping enterprises use Postgres for, let's see, I've been with them for 10 years, so I guess it might be 12 years. Uh, they've been working with Postgres, are very involved, as are many other companies like Postgres Pro in Russia and um, some companies in Germany. and in England and Japan and all over the world, Brazil. Uh, we've always had a very lucky uh, global team of people who work on Postgres. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the history of that and also uh, talk a little bit about the future and then take your questions. Does anyone have a question before we get started? Okay, good. So let's talk about the past of Postgres. And um, I guess I'm a good one to do it. 20 years is a long time. Uh, I didn't start assuming Postgres was going to be this incredibly popular database. I got involved really because it was a very interesting technology to me. So um, for those of you who have boring jobs and you want to get involved in open source, that was me. Um, when I got involved, uh, I actually was working at a, uh, for, law, for uh, law firms and I was writing financial reports. So after seven years of writing financial reports, and Jan, you have a similar financial background. Yes, I do. Um, it gets very boring and you're not growing. So I said, well, how am I gonna grow professionally? How am I gonna learn new things in technology? And Postgres is where I got started and fortunately it's become tremendously popular. Postgres actually started long before me. It actually started as a, a, a university research project uh, actually funded by the United States uh, government. And uh, basically there is a, a university in, um, near San Francisco called the University of California at Berkeley. And that's where uh, Postgres started. It's also where BSD Unix or FreeBSD, that BSD uh, operating system all started from that same university about the same time. Uh, the, the sort of architect of this uh, database uh, was Michael Stonebreaker. Uh, I've never met him, but hopefully someday I will. Um, he basically uh, led a group of graduate students to write this database. Uh, two of the graduate students who stayed the longest, uh, Jolie Chen and Andrew Yu, uh, actually were very involved in sort of just about when I started. So during that first 10 years, this is where all the work was happening at Berkeley. Um, basically, the, uh, the project relational databases really started in the mid-70s uh, with Ingress. And then, became, then there was a new version called Postgres, eventually Postgres 95, and I started in 96. So here's sort of the years. Uh, 1977 is Ingress. How many of you have heard of the Ingress database? Oh, good, yeah, I used the Ingress database in the 90s on VMS. Uh, very, I actually enjoyed it. Uh, it was very, uh, very a good experience. But Postgres really started in 1986. So that's when the sort of brand new idea of Postgres came about. The idea of creating a, a post-relational database. A, they had Ingress, this was basically post-Ingress. Right, that's how the name Postgres became. And the reason it was different was because it was designed to look ahead. Again, this is in 1986, but to look ahead and say what type of relational system will we need 10 years from now, 20 years from now. And some of the strengths that Postgres has now actually comes from the design 
that they had in 1986. The idea of a, of a database that's not a static set of languages, a static set of data types, a static set of, of index types, a static set of operators, Postgres is extendable. That's why it's an, called an object relational database. And that extensibility has, done, has given Postgres a lot of popularity. It's allowed JSON to be added very easily. It's allowed HStore to be added very easily. It's allowed GIS to be added very easily. And it allows additional data types, additional functionality. Even though the software is 30 years old, the database still appears to be modern because of the design and the ability to add things very seamlessly. This is a list of the first, <clears throat> I'm trying to speak loud because I know there are people in the back. Uh, this is a list of the first, uh, I guess, 10, five years uh, of Postgres. I got involved about here, um, about, I think, around this time. Uh, well, actually, somewhere between these two. Um, so the reason I show this slide is because you can get an idea of the progression of the Postgres code. So over here you can see how much code was added, what percentage of code was added every year. Here you can see how many months it took for each, release, each major release. And when we look at all of the releases since 2000, you see a very smooth progression, okay? So you have basically changes somewhere in the eight to 10% range. Obviously a little lot of variability there. And you see major releases happening, again, between the 10 and 14 month range. Um, so you have a very consistent database, a uh, database that's advancing very quickly. And frankly, uh, there's really no other database in the, in the world that's advancing at the same speed technologically as Postgres. It's not Oracle, it's not Mongo, it's not MySQL, certainly. Uh, it's really Postgres. Um, <clears throat> because when you look at a major release of Postgres, uh, and actually you can see, I'm sorry, you can see right here, the number of new release note items, the number of features added every year, somewhere between 150, 170, to somewhere about 250, okay? These are, these are major things that are being added every year in the database. And that's one of the reasons there's so much excitement because it's basically harnessing so many brilliant minds in Estonia, in Russia, in Brazil, in, in Japan, China, and Singapore, and so forth, who are all working together to create this database. No company alone could do this, but with open source, similar to Linux, with open source, you can have this incredibly fast development cycle and this in incredibly uh, amazing software that comes out and gets improved every year. Who are the people who actually improve it? Um, this is a picture from 10 years ago. Okay, I didn't give you a current picture. I gave you a picture from 10 years ago and I would say that 90% of these people are still active. Right? Um, Oleg, you're here. Jan, you're here, right? I'm not on that one. You're not on this I was, one. I was missing oh. on that conference. Shame on you. Yes. Shame on you. Sasha, you weren't you weren't involved. You were a little baby at that point, I think. Is, <laughs> is, is, <laughs> <laughs> a, we have a little stroller in the back where Sasha's there listening. Uh, but Oleg, where are you? You're over you're right there, right there. Yes. There he is. Yep. So the cool thing is that these people are still, almost all of them are still active. I can, I can probably give you five or 10 that aren't active anymore, uh, but everyone else is still active. And obviously this is, this is the first time we met in person in a lot of cases. Uh, so obviously in the past 10 years it's grown. Again, I attend about 30 events a year. There's probably more like 60 uh, conferences a year related to Postgres all over the world. I only attend probably half of them. Um, but it is a very, a very exciting team to be part of. So let's talk about the present. Let's talk about kind of what Postgres is, why it's important to you. Um, and, and again, there, there's, it's hard to kind of encapsulate the huge adoption that Postgres has. Um, 
but it's basically at this point in all industries, um, in all organization sizes from small to very large. For example, MasterCard uh, has standardized on Postgres now. Uh, there used to be a time when I started, uh, you know, when, I, when we started, usually the people using Postgres had like small web server usually, you know, and maybe, maybe you get to a medium sized one. Okay, and I used to tell people, you know, Postgres is good, but it's really not ready to run like a bank on. Like that was kind of like to me the top, right? And then like probably eight, ten years ago, people started running all sorts of banks on Postgres, like Morgan Stanley and oh, Bank of Brazil, right? So there's a lot of banks now who are using Postgres in production. So I'm like, okay, I can't say you can't use Postgres in banks anymore. I'd say, you know, it's good. It can you can do a bank. But like a credit card company, that's like we're not there yet. Well, when, when MasterCard standardized this year on Postgres, I don't really have a thing to say anymore. I don't really have a sort of a, a top that we can't go to. Um, what's this? NASA. Now, well, NASA we've had for, yeah, we've had that bazillion years. Um, <laughs> there you go. Um, so what basically, what basically happened is we started out with kind of a small to medium sized workload. And we kind of worked up a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And then we, I'd say we got to, we, we probably 15 or 10 years ago, we were sort of, the, sort of the middle high range of what Oracle could do, or maybe the low of the high range of what Oracle could do. And then over the years, obviously the past 10 years, we're now sort of in the middle of the high range of what Oracle can do, kind of working into the high, high end of what Oracle can do. Oracle, in my mind, being sort of the top in terms of the range of workloads that you can, you can produce. Yeah. Yeah, um, Bruce, in, in the industry where I was working, uh, uh, enterprise resource uh, management systems, there was a saying, you can't get fired for buying Oracle. Because Oracle was the safe industry standard and every IT manager who introduced Oracle into a project was safe. Even if the project went wrong, he did not make the wrong decision by buying Oracle. And that is, I believe, a reason why the Postgres introduction into these major industries like banks, credit cards, financial institutions, took so long, we, we plateaued because of the fear of the manager to be blamed for the product right. failure by taking something other than Oracle, and, other than the industry standard. And that's, that's a great point because really to, to get adoption of a database within an enterprise, you really need two allies within the organization. You need the engineers to be behind the adoption of the database. Um, either on technological reasons or frankly on, on career reasons because they see Postgres as a growing opportunity for them as a new technology that's sort of up and coming and they want to be involved in it, okay? But you, but you also need the managers to also sort of buy into it primarily for a cost saving and a reliability and a flexibility, that's another uh, aspect of Postgres that it's so easy to install. It doesn't require a huge licensing uh, dance to get it installed. Um, you, there's, there's not the kind of lock-in and the rigidity that you typically get in a commercial database. So really to get into large organizations or, and pretty much any organization, you have to have both of those layers. If you only have one, things don't work well. Um, and fortunately, Postgres has gotten to a point uh, basically that all of those criteria are now met and where they're feeling very confident. Um, this is sort of a, just a smattering of where I've been. Uh, we have tremendous problems in Africa. <laughs> I've never been there. Uh, we do have some use of, Af uh, of Postgres in government in Africa. I think like the Ivory Coast uses it and there's a couple other. Uh, 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 Ethiopia uses it and I think Ghana but we need a lot of work there. The Middle East also, for some reason, has not been big. And this is, this is kind of paralleling open source adoption. So 
Open source adoption, there's not a whole lot of it in those areas either. So again, Postgres is sort of following the same wave. The rest of the world, we're doing really well. Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, Europe, certainly Russia. Uh, the United States, Latin America are obviously very, very fully covered. So why do people choose Postgres? Um, one option, one reason is that uh, proprietary databases are a closed source. You can't see inside of it. Of course, in Postgres you can. Um, with uh, proprietary databases, you have that, it's that rigidity I'm talking about. You can only go to one place for support. We have many, I'm sorry, I have a plug for my company in there, shame on me. But we have a whole bunch of ways you can get support. You can, I'm sorry the colors didn't even come out well, but you can look at the source code yourself. You can ask the mailing list, ask the, the global community. But you can also go to not only our company, but dozens of other companies all over the world um, who provide support in the, in the local cities, in the local languages, come to your office, right? There's not the lock-in because any company can read the source code, right? When any company can read the source code, I can have a company in Japan, I can have a company in Austria, I have a company in the United States or Brazil, they're all equal in terms of supporting the software because they can all see it. And that's really, I think, part of that flexibility that you have. Um, in terms of performance features and reliability, having been here 20 years, I can tell you that Postgres started down here. It started with fewer features, less reliability, less performance. But <clears throat> the interesting thing about working for something for years is it doesn't matter where you are now. What matters is how quickly you're improving. Okay? No matter how far you start down at the bottom, if you're improving quicker than everyone else, eventually you're going to pass them. And I would say now, certainly Postgres has passed almost all the relational systems in these, in these measures. There are some areas where obviously we're still catching up, but in general, um, I think we're somewhere up here somewhere uh, in terms of what Postgres can do. And I think that's something that's generating a lot of excitement about Postgres. Okay. Um, so to, to sort of verbally give you why people like Postgres, certainly the cost is one of them. Flexibility I talked about is another one. Enterprise DB did a survey with an, uh, Gartner did a survey for Enterprise DB. The, 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 if you go to my website, there's a blog about it and you can read the report. But it basically surveys independently a number of Enterprise DB customers and you can see numbers on how much money they saved, why they chose it, the flexibility of being able to deploy today when you have a need for something. You don't have to call your salesman to deploy. You just install it in 20 minutes and you're going. Okay? And a lot of that simplicity is, is allows companies to be much more flexible, allows companies to deploy much more quickly. And because they're saving money, their products are now less expensive to customers because they're not having to bundle an expensive database with their product. So it opens new markets for them, it gives them flexibility, and it saves costs at the same time. Um, <clears throat> obviously, it's being developed very quickly, um, it's very reliable, and the open license, again, is a, is a big plus. That's a great question. So the question is, who's paying uh, let me just back up here. Who's paying all these people? I can tell you, I get this question all the time, right? Because I'll, like, it's kind of funny because I'm, you know, I live in Philadelphia, which is on the East Coast in the United States, and when I'm not traveling, I'm home. So I don't, I don't go to an office. I work from my home. I've done that for like 20 years, 15 years. And <clears throat> so all the people who know me know me as the husband who's always home, except when he's going to some strange place, right? Like Pakistan or Moscow or Singapore. And they're basically trying to figure out he has a job, but he's home. And then he disappears for a couple weeks, and then he comes back. This is very, very, very suspicious. People think I work for the government, something, you know. Um, but effectively, 
there are, there are companies all over the world who, have, who are doing this kind of support. Okay, so Postgres Professional, these two gentlemen are from Postgres Professional, they're from Russia. Their company pays them, they support Postgres in Russia, right? Jan Vik works for a company in the United States, they do Postgres support. They're paying him, okay? My company's in Boston, they pay me. Um, and if I look through the other list of people, um, I know like there's a whole bunch of people over here who are paid by companies in Japan who do Postgres support. Uh, there's a couple, this is a guy from Japan. This guy, uh, he works for Second Quadrant, which was out of, which is like a global company out of England, uh, headquartered in England, but all over. Um, so this guy is from NTT in Japan, okay? Uh, Magnus, I think that's Magnus, he works for uh, Red Pill, which is in Sweden, they do Postgres support. So effectively, it's a very distributed model. Everyone is all sort of thrown in together, uh, but our loyalty is to the software. Loyalty is not to our company <laughs> who pays us, it's to the software. And we all work together in a cooperative way, similar to the way Linux is developed, um, to make sure that that works. Yes? Um, so the question is, is Postgres need a lot of support, okay? And all these people... And all these people, support. right, right. So, so the answer is that the salespeople in some companies have come to me and they said, you know, when we're trying to sell support, we have problems because people haven't needed support for years and they don't know why they should buy it. Can you like add some bugs so that we have something to do? <laughs> now, of course, they're joking, right? Well, they're salespeople, so maybe they're half joking, right? They're like, well, you know. So the answer is no, you don't need a lot. But you do, one of the interesting things, and I learned this long ago, um, is that some technology, some software is very straightforward to use, right? Like when you use GCC, a compiler, right? It's a compiler. You write the C code, you compile it, you run it, right? Emacs, it's an editor, right? PHP or Perl, these are languages. You just write in the language. You don't, you don't really need an infrastructure around PHP. Like, it's just you write your application or using Perl or using Python or using an editor. That is not true of databases. In a lot of ways, databases, because they are mission critical and they have a lot of demands, performance demands, reliability demands, and so forth, are sort of in a different league for support. So I, even, I think even more than operating system, like an operating system, how many people tune an operating system? Like no, very few. And, Probably a couple people, but not many. But almost every database, because the workloads change and everything has to be really fast and so forth, you really need to have somebody tune it, right? At least once. And you need to do backups. And you need to make sure those backups are reliable. And you have to have a disaster recovery plan. And you have to be able to restore data that gets deleted. Or, and you have regulatory requirements. So. It's not that Postgres is unreliable, it's actually that the database space itself is one that really lends itself. Because I, I know a guy who wrote a very popular scripting language, which I'm not gonna mention. And I, he works for a company and he wrote a very popular scripting language, but he, he spends a lot of his time like writing scripts for the company. And I'm like, you wrote this amazingly popular language, why are you, why aren't you like touring the world and, and working on the software? And he's, he's like, well, once it works, people really don't need any help, right? Whereas with database, I think that's different. And if you think of the databases you've used, you kind of have, a, there's a lot to it. It does a lot. And I think databases sort of need more of that support that you wouldn't necessarily need for something like a scripting language or a compiler or something like that. I think that's... I think that's why these companies are successful. 
and why they're, why, how they're able to generate enough income so they can pay me just to fly around. Like, I, I spend 80% of my time on the community. Only 20% of my time do I actually spend going to conferences or talking to customers. So they're paying me from somewhere to do this kind of thing and 10 years of just supporting Postgres. And before I did that, I worked for one of these Japanese companies. Exactly, they did the five years. They paid me just to support Postgres. They call me like four times a year, I get a question from them. And the rest of the year, I was just working on the community. And they, that paid because they wanted to make sure that software was good and they wanted to continue to grow it into so many very lucrative companies. But there's probably four reasons these people are here. One, they're paid by a company to be there as from a support company. Two, they're paid by a user of Postgres to be there, a company that uses Postgres in their organization. Three, they're there because they want to learn. If you're doing database development, open source, like we're it, we're the big person, we're the big team that does database. So if you're interested in learning how databases work inside, if you're interested in understanding how things are parsed and how the optimizer works and how to make things faster, you join just to learn. I mean, Sasha, you joined, he wrote a, a doctoral paper of, that used Postgres and now he's flying all over the world at conferences, right? But he didn't start that way. He started kind of as writing a doctoral thesis for a university in Moscow that ended up getting him a job and getting him sort of, you know, a whole career now as part of that. And some of the people are doing it just because they want to give back. They, they, they're tired of working just for companies and they want to give back to the, the larger world with better software. So there's really a very varied reason people do it. I was a volunteer for four years, three years at the beginning. So I, did, I wasn't paid. Like I just did it because I was learning so much. These people who in the Postgres community were so much smarter than I was that I was learning new, very interesting things from them. And that to me was worth it. It was worth spending my time. I hid a lot of that time from my wife. She didn't know all the time I spent on it sometimes. And she'd sort of say, well, how come you're, she, she would look at my, uh, my monthly report, you know, and I got paid based on how many hours I worked. And she'd say, you know, it was kind of low last month. And I'd say, I know, we had a Postgres release and I had to do some stuff. And, and then, you know, it happened, it happened a couple times. And then, you know, she said, well, why don't you spend more time with the family instead of doing this Postgres thing? And you're like, I don't know, it's interesting. You know, I'm learning something. <laughs> I, you know, what can you tell her, right? And, and as it got more popular, I think once I helped a, a flower company and they sent a whole bunch of flowers on Monday and she's like, wow, we just got flowers. I'm like, yeah, I took a phone call and helped somebody and they sent us a huge amount of flowers. She's like, oh, we should do more calls like that, right? And then, and then I was asked to write a book about Postgres, one of the first books in English. And my wife's like, wow, you're gonna be an author, you know, like, like this is, this is not terrible. Maybe there is something here. So in a lot of ways, I kind of hid it, but I learned a lot. And I basically said, this is my growth. This is how I'm going to be a better software engineer, is working. I used to have a guy out of Krasnoyarsk who was amazingly smart. And every time he would write something, I would learn something new. So for me, it was personal growth. That's what started it. And then I got a job and then, you know, everything started to happen. The question is, how do you choose a professional support company? There are so many of them. And the, the actual, that is actually a problem, okay? The bottom line is when you purchase proprietary software, you don't have a decision to make. You have to go to the vendor who can see the software, whether that's Oracle or Sybase or whatever company. So when you buy a proprietary database, you have no choice in who your provider is and who's gonna support it. Because Postgres is open source, all of a sudden you have a problem. You have to choose. Now that's a good thing, but it's a little more work. So you have to look at who's providing support, right? And then what are the strengths of those companies? So some of the companies have a lot of tooling 
around for enterprise deployments of Postgres. So they're really kind of keyed into large enterprise use of Postgres, sort of adding tooling that makes it more like an Oracle deployment of Postgres. Okay. There are some companies who assume that you're real hardcore engineers and you just want to talk to more engineers, right? So they're not really sort of giving you enterprise like a wrapper around Postgres. They're more allowing, giving you a backup for your own engineering team, okay? There are other companies who not only will do support, but they'll do development to help you. So they'll help your developers, okay? Um, that, so that's a different company, right? And then there's some companies who specialize in certain regions. So, uh, you know, Postgres Professional so really kind of focuses on the Russian region primarily as their market, okay? Uh, Jan's company, OpenSCG, I think they're more of, they're more do, uh, not only will they help support you, but they'll do, it'll help do development for you, uh, software development for you. Sort of as a combo, sort of together. There's not a lot of companies that'll do that. Second Quadrant does a lot of just general, general consulting and general, you know, support for you. And then there's companies in Japan who have hardware with Postgres specialty and obviously they obviously know the Asian market very well. Um, there's companies in China who do that. There's companies in Brazil. So it, it's kind of all over the map. What I recommend people do is they just pick a company and they try it. And if they don't like it, they can go to somewhere else. That's, the, that's really, I think, the beauty of it because, because none of the companies are bad. Because a lot of, when you're, you, when you're paying Oracle for support, you don't have a choice. If they're good or bad, you have to use them, right? So there's no motivation for Oracle to give you a good support experience because you're a hostage, really, okay? When you're getting support for Postgres, if you, if you're, you're, the people who are giving you support realize they have to make you very happy. Because if you aren't happy, you'll go to someone else the next week, right? And I think that is one of the great things about it, that the support, no matter what company you pick, and there's a nice company in, in Austria, I didn't even mention, they're just very close to here, um, uh, Cybertech. So the, the beauty of it, I think, and, 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 and Creditive, which is out of Germany. Um, so the beauty of it is that all the companies are good, because if they weren't, they would be out of business because they don't have a hostage group that they can just treat badly, um, which I think is somewhat true for a lot of the of the proprietary databases. Yeah, the all the support experience usually is very bad, and, and I've gotten very good reports from enterprise DB support. I'm sure Open SCG and uh, Postgres Pro also have excellent. I'm sure all the companies have excellent reputations. So is there a good way to improve Postgres in languages with memory checking and compile time checking? There, there's, there's two aspects of that, okay? The first is that I talked a little earlier about Postgres being extendable, okay? So we support, I think, 15 different languages for stored procedures, okay? So PHP, we support Java, we support. There's a Java stored procedure. Perl, Python, C, C++, uh, Ruby, um, uh, Schema, Shell Script. Tickle. Tickle. Oh, well, how can I forget? I forget. Tickle, thank you. Ah, just should have been right up at the top, Jan. Exactly. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, JavaScript, JavaScript, thank you. PLV8, thank you. That's a great one. So one of the nice things about Postgres is that you have this huge and a similar one to PLSQL called PLPGSQL, which you know is terribly designed and really I should stay away from it completely. But so so I talked about those dozen stored procedure languages that you can write in. But if you want to modify the server code itself, that's going to be in C. We do have some people who are looking at LLVM, particularly for the executor, which would allow for faster execution uh, without as many call uh, stack 
um, uh, kind of overhead. Uh, but <clears throat> um, I don't think we're ever going to leave C. You can compile Postgres in C++. So if you'd rather use C++ for some server-side stuff, you can do that. Um, but we're probably going to stick with C for the for the for the long midterm future. I don't see us moving there. The Linux kernel's written in C. A lot of open source stuff's written in C. I know it's hard, um, but it's it's hard to it's hard to see where we would go that would would give us enough benefit to make that change. Like we couldn't write it in Java. It would just really be bad. Yeah, it just isn't it isn't a suitable language for the types of performance requirements that we have uh, for the database. And that's an excellent question. The, the concept is that, that, that architecture is changing over time and how is Postgres going to adapt to that? So one of the things um, actually related to the LLVM case is that, is that we have a lot of people who are now looking at... I mean, if, if I look at the stages that a query has to go through, uh, you know, the parser is probably as lean as, lean as it can be the optimizer is pretty good. We're starting. We make incremental changes there, but I don't see a, a wholesale change. But the executor um, is really where we're seeing the bottleneck now. Where particularly when you have a, a data warehouse type of case where you're churning through a lot of rows, you all of that C call stack and all that function call overhead is is really eating up a lot of CPU time, a lot of CPU cache misses. So I would say we're looking at, um, at that uh, executor phase either to, uh, there's, there's, I have some blog entries about it, but particularly things like LLVM, things like pre-compiling the structure of certain tables. So Postgres has a binary representation of where the rows are. Um, we, we are really extending in that area. And obviously another area we're looking at is sharding, the idea of having not just one Postgres server, but dozens of Postgres servers that can operate as a unit uh, to, to represent very large data sets. So I'd say we're, we're working at the micro level in terms of optimizing the call stack and the executor, and we're looking at the macro level in terms of hosting just dozens of Postgreses where your data is spread across dozens of machines and having that work seamlessly. Um, so I think we're doing growth in both areas. So parallel query is something we, we identified probably three or four years ago as something we're missing. And Robert Haas has been working very uh, diligently. And 9.6 has some parallel query capability. And I think we're going we're to be extending in that area. Remember I said that Postgres was good like to the low high end of Oracle or the middle high end of Oracle. Now we're starting to have, we're starting to tune Postgres for you know, 16 socket, 12 socket servers where you've probably got 100 some cores or 140 cores uh, running. And we are basically optimizing it, as Sasha said, for these very large systems where Postgres is now running, you know, thousands of concurrent connections. And uh, fortunately, we've been very lucky to get access to that very large hardware. And there have been some major improvements we've made in 9.5 and 9.6. I would say, for that very large hardware space. One nice thing in 9.6, which Sasha was also involved in, is the ability, we can now look and do a, a like a, we can now see where the delays are. So we now have wait events we can, we can track, and we can see where the bottlenecks are in these very large servers. And we can then look, oh, okay, for this type of workload, this is the area that's a problem. We can see a chart says 80% of my loss is right here, and then I can, we can target those areas. So I would say in the future, we're going to continue to expand in that large server space as well. So the question is, can we, are we going to get to a point where we're not going to need to have support, we're not going to, have to need to tune the database? Um, I, think, I think we're heading in that direction. I mean, if you look at how, if you look at how easy Postgres is to administer compared to a typical proprietary database, we're already doing very well. Um, Postgres, in a lot of cases, doesn't need a DBA. It's put in copiers, it's put in cable boxes, it's put in video cameras, it's put in all sorts of devices that just go out by the millions and nobody's administering it because 
there's nobody can even access it. It's just trapped in a device somewhere. Okay, um, and a lot of people are using Postgres with no tuning at all. The, the place we see a lot of support and a lot of tuning is when you're really pushing the limits of your hardware. So most, let's face it, most database servers are idle. They're not doing a whole lot, right? They're just sitting there and, oh, here's a query, let me execute it. Um, but normally people are not pushing their database servers to the limit. And for those people, they don't really need a DBA to be monitoring it or check. Everything pretty much works. Um, but when you're pushing Postgres to the limits, when you want that extra 10% of performance, uh, you're kind of still going to need somebody who really knows what's going on. Because unlike a compiler, which pretty much said, you know, you, you send the code to the compiler, the same thing comes out. Like, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Databases have a very varied work requirement. There's reporting, there's, there's ad hoc queries, there's, you know, 20 requests coming in at once, and, and then the system's idle for an hour. And then all of a sudden, something else crazy happens. So if you need that, that what the database does is basically interpret a language concurrently with other requests that are coming in, which can have completely different requirements. So I don't, I think a database is somehow unique in, in sort of having a very unusual set of demands placed upon it. And I think there's always going to still be some need at some point um, it, for people who know what they're doing. And obviously the data reliability case where you got to make sure your backups work, you got to make sure replication works, you got to make sure how long the failover part works. That stuff is very hard to automate because it's got to work 100%. I think we're getting better, but I don't think it's ever going to go away. Um, and I think Postgres in, in some ways is better than a lot of the other options out there. Yes. There's also uh, the thing um, when people want more and more uh, self-driven things, uh, you know, one click install and everything is fine, that works very well with self-contained systems that are not influenced from the outside. A database by its nature is influenced from the outside because the data that's coming in is unforeseeable more or less. And now you have application developers yeah. who eventually make a mistake. And yeah. now you have uh, a data corruption issue. Not on the database level. The database did everything it was told, but the application developer made a mistake. Now you need an expert that needs to know exactly how to recover that case. And since this whole case is unforeseeable, you can't really program the system to know exactly what to do in that case. So now you need the expert, and that is where, again, a different type of support comes into play. Remote DBAs, subscription-based services, where you can just call somebody and uh, they will fix it sure. for you, because they are the experts on standby. Sure. It's, it's, again, another service type. Yeah. But Good. I agree with Bruce. This 100% service-free, yes, for, an, for a little thing where you say, oh, this is my personal block, and if it crashes, then I start from scratch. Or I have an export that I want right. to import. That's fine. We so, don't need DBAs for that. So you can go, you can go de support free if the, if the functionality the database gives you is so simple. Like a key value store, there's not a whole lot you can do with it. It's just a key and a value, right? So, so because the API is so simple, there's not so much, you can't tune it, you can't really optimize it. Everything you, every optimization has to happen in the application, okay? So your application's gonna be really complicated, but the key value store is super simple, we don't need to do anything there, right? By definition, relational systems have a huge amount of smarts in there, and it's that smart sometimes you need to tune. Let me finish the slides and we can wrap up. Um, basically, this is the evolution of where I see Postgres having been. Uh, again, this is when I started in 96, the, the crash period. Um, SQL standards came later, enterprise uh, usage came later, enterprise features came later, and what you're gonna notice here is that we pretty much filled out the enterprise feature set about 2012. Now, I didn't realize at the time, but now that I look back, probably 2012 was when that feature set was filled out. So when you've now matched all the features 
of all of the proprietary databases and all the enterprise needs, what do you do? What do you do as a piece of software? What you basically start to look at is going into innovation, things that no one else does, okay? So things like JSON, PostGIS, range types, advanced indexing, which allows applications to be much, use the database in a new way. Um, scalability starts to become an issue. You asked that question in terms of sharding and going to large servers. These are the kind of things we've been dealing with uh, since 2012. And in fact, when you look at this slide, it kind of shows you Postgres moving in a bunch of directions at once, which I think is really hard to get your head around. But this is probably a great slide to finish with. Effectively, most companies who develop databases, they can really only go in one direction at a time. Like, it's kind of hard for a company to go in two directions at a time. It's impossible for them to go to three directions at a time. But because Postgres is a distributed model, because we have people all over the world doing all of this type of work, we have people who are focusing on ease of deployment. And there, we got a whole bunch of things in 9.6 for that. We got people who are working on high-end enterprise requirements. And they're moving in that direction. And we've got a whole bunch of people working in new data, new, new data layouts, big data, cloud, JSON, um, foreign data wrappers. And, and, and so you kind of have the, you have the scaling guys down here. You've got, you've got the sort of new data out here. And then you've got the, the zero, basically closer to zero support requirement, right? Ease of use, auto tuning a bunch of stuff in there. And this, I think, I, we had a guy at Enterprise DB who actually gave this presentation, this slide, and I was like, wow, this is really great because it, it really illustrates to me where Postgres is going. And that is really three directions at once, which I think is going to make it powerful. It's, we're going into a phase where Postgres is innovating. Frankly, we can copy the features of other databases, but where we really do well is innovation, right? Companies can innovate very well. Companies have to buy other companies to innovate. Open source by its nature is very good at bringing out the best ideas from your community and implementing them. And I think that's what you're going to see in the years ahead. So we're out of time, I believe, and I'll be here to answer any questions. And uh, I want to thank you for your time. And it was a great audience. And then your questions as well. Thank you.